guys, welcome to Better Bachelor. This is Joker with a face for radio and a voice for print. Today I'm going to read a fun story. Not fun for the person involved, but a fun story for us because I think it does two things. Number one, this is going to sound very familiar to a lot of you guys that have become bachelors and are going your own way. When I read this story myself, I said, you know, there are aspects of this that mirror what happened to me when I was much younger. Now, of course, this wasn't the last time I ever dated, but it was the first step into my doubting that dating was going to be right for me. I think a lot of times when we're grown up, and especially when you're my age, maybe not so much for some of you younger guys, but when you're my age now, we were kind of led to believe, uh, you know, my, my mother my and my father, my grandparents, my aunt and uncle, uh, cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody was married for a very long time. And so when you talk about, you know, hey, when I, when I get older and I meet that right girl, I'm going to get married and, and, and then I'm done. Like I'm off the market and I'll have a great girlfriend that turns into a wife and we'll buy the, the picket fence and, you know, everything's going to be awesome. And then it just completely falls apart. And this reading through this is exactly in some ways how it happened to me. I was in the military, did my four years. I was uh, in the Air Force. I was a law enforcement officer. And I didn't, I didn't choose to be a law enforcement officer. I went under what they call general, and which means that I can, I can basically get assigned any job. And they assigned police officer to me. And it was fun and it was interesting, but I wasn't born to be a police officer. And when I got out of the service, I, I met a girl. Uh, we fell in love. Got in, I proposed to her, got engaged. And within a month or two after we were engaged and talking about living together, she didn't ghost me, but she faded. And it was just, this isn't working for us and so on and so forth. And I remember driving to her workplace in tears because I thought this was going to be the love of my life. We were going to be together, begging her, shame to say it, but I was what, 20, 21 at the time. No, I was 22 at the time. So this was the, like the first serious relationship I had. And I was begging her going, what did I do wrong? What can we do to fix this? You know, because when my parents had disagreements, we they always talked through it. So I thought I just figured, well, this is something we can talk through. Of course, now looking back, I was I was completely, uh, uh, ugh, you know, it was completely unattractive to beg and be so desperate. But I thought that's what you did as a guy. I thought, you know, I'm supposed to make this work. I'm supposed to to be the strong, you know, figure in this relationship. And I must have done something horribly wrong. Come to find out, her parents had introduced her through another family friend or something to some guy that had a lot more money, was a little bit older. I think he was around 28 or 30. It was a trust fund kid, so he had tons of cash. He drove around a very fancy car. And uh, she just decided to climb on up the ladder before we even got started. So this story here is kind of a similar, but it's coming from the woman's uh, view and how she decided to uh, how, did, how she decided to climb the ladder before getting married and swinging up to the next branch higher, looking for the next better thing. Only she missed. And there were no branches that were any higher. And she ended up being alone, no, no, uh, no kids. And she's now 42. So let's read through this and then we'll talk about it a little more. I left the love of my life because I'm, I thought I could do better. Now I'm childless and alone at 42. This is written by Karen Cross. Laughing and dancing with my fiancé at our engagement party, I thought I might actually burst with happiness. Surrounded by our family and friends, I looked at Matthew and felt certain I had met the man I was going to spend the rest of my life with. Quite simply, he was my soulmate. She does not look very happy now. I guess she realizes her mistake. We were desperately in love and had our future life together mapped out. First, we, uh, first we would save to buy our own home, and then would come a romantic wedding ceremony and children would follow. It all seemed so simple to my naive 19-year-old self. I was smugly, I was, I smugly told myself, the girl who had it all. So why 20 years later do I find myself single, childless, and tormented by the fact that I have thrown away the only true chance of happiness I ever had? Eight years since that, after that wonderful engagement party in 1989, I walked away from my dear, devoted, loyal Matthew, convinced that somewhere out there, a better, more exciting, more fulfilling life awaited me. Only there wasn't. You know, if you look back at the video I just put out, um, which is, well, let me bring the title of that up for you guys here, because I, I forget. I, I put out so many. Uh, if you look at the, the title, the thumbnail is the, um, 
the, the butterflies chasing chasing emotional highs how uh, when the butterflies are gone so is she I'll put a link right up in the corner um, but when you if you look at that that's what I was talking about the emotional highs they always need that rush the excitement the butterflies and when they go she does too and here's a great case of that she says it herself so a better more exciting more fulfilling life awaited me now I am 42 and I have the trappings of success high flying career which doesn't mean anything to a man in a relationship financial security men again usually take care of that themselves and a home in the heart of London's trendy Notting Hill but I don't have the one thing I crave more than anything a loving husband and family You see, I never did find another man who offered me everything Matthew did, who understood me and loved me like he did, someone who was my best friend as well as my lover. You know, when we talk about relationships, a lot of times, guys, and you guys tell me in the comments below, because you guys are great at commenting, whether you disagree with me or I screw something up or get a number wrong, and and that's cool. I'm, I'm fine with it. I appreciate it, actually. I try to read them as much as I can. But how many of you guys, if somebody said to you, you know, what you know, back in the days when you were dating or if you're, if you're still dating, what would it take for you to find a quote unquote good woman? Not perfect because no one's perfect. I got to shave soon. My mustache hair is tickling my nose. Um, what would it take to find a good woman? And most of us would guys would say, you know, if she was my friend and we could hang out, we had similar things we liked doing together. She, she let me do my own thing and have a little bit of space. She didn't take over the house. Um, you know, she paid for half the dates because I don't feel it's right that guys should always pay. We fooled around, you know, often enough that both our needs were met. She didn't cheat on me or lie to me. She just was, you know, a good, a good, like a good person, a good partner. That's it. Like our, you know, we don't need that much to be happy, but you know, here, here's a case where again, he provided all that and she just It's not enough for her. She needs more. So let's continue on. So she says, Today, seeing my friends with their children around them tortures me, as I know I am unlikely to ever have a family of my own. She's 42, so so statistically, 42 statistically, that's not going to happen. Because even if she found somebody and got married within a year or two, she's then at 44, it's too late. I think about the times Matthew and I talked about having children, even discussing the names we would choose. I cannot believe I turned my back on so much happiness. Instead, instead, here I am back on the singles market looking for the very thing I discarded with barely a backward glance all those years ago. I know I can't have Matthew back and it hurts when I hear snippets of information about his life and how content he is. 15 years after I ended our relationship, he is happily married. At this time of year, so many people will be assessing their lives and relationships, wondering if the grass is greener on the other side. Many will mistake contentment for boredom. That's what I was saying. Contentment is where love actually lies. Okay? Contentment, you can't be happy all the time. You can't be excited all the time. You can't have butterflies all the time. The world doesn't work like that. You're going to find a place where you land into contentment and into things are good. How are things? Things are okay. Things are good. Like things are going along great. Are you happy? I, I guess so. Yeah. Right? That's where all of us are every day, whether you're alone or with somebody else. That's where you spend 95% of your life. There's bad days. There's great days. But most of the time, you're content. Men don't walk around happy all day. How are you? I'm happy. I'm, uh, yeah. No, we're, I'm good. Would you change anything? Not really. I'm good. How about this? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. That's, that's where we live. So that's what a relationship is. That's what everything is. Anyway, how different things would be for, uh, how, how different things would be for me now if I'd only listened to Matthew when he pleaded with me not to leave him in 1997, tears pouring down his face. I was crying too, and it tortured me to watch the heart of the man I loved breaking in front of me, but I was resolute. See, so even though he said, hey, I love you, let's make this work. What, you know, he probably said, what did I, I know, because this is what I did. What did I do wrong? What can I do to fix this? How do we, you know, I thought we were going to do X, Y, Z, but again, one day I might look back and realize I've made the biggest mistake of my life. I told him as we clung to each other desperately, how prophetic that these words have proven to be. I will always be here for you, Matthew promised. 
and I arrogantly thought that somehow I could put him on ice and return to him. You know, hearing those words, I know I said those to my ex when I was 22 years old. I know I said that. And looking back, it makes me cringe how just needy and desperate I sounded. But, but at the time, when you don't have a lot of relationships under your belt, that's how you speak. That's how you, you because when you love somebody for the first time, you, you, you're, you're, not, you're not ready to deal with the pain and the loss. Matthew and I met when we were when we attended the same comprehensive school in, uh, uh, I guess, in the UK. Uh, we started dating just before Christmas in 1987 when I was 17, studying for my A levels. By that time, he had left school and was working as a motorcycle career. We got uh, we got on like a house on fire, and our families each supported our, the relationship. Before long, we'd fallen in love. Matthew was romantic but incredibly practical, something that would later come to annoy me. His gifts to me that Christmas were a leather jacket and a pair of thermal leggings. Two weeks later, when we'd been seeing each other for less than a month, he proposed. We were in my little mini clubman when he shouted at me to stop the car. Scared something was wrong, I braked in the middle of traffic and we both jumped out. Then, oblivious to the other drivers beeping in their horns, he got down on one knee in the middle of the road, said, I love you, Karen Cross. Promise me you'll marry me one day. I laughed and said yes, thrilled that he felt the same way that I did. So she was ready for it. In the summer of 1989, while out for a romantic meal, Matthew proposed properly with a diamond solitaire ring. Two months later, we held our engagement party for 40 friends and family at the little house we were renting at the time. The following year, we we bought a tiny starter home in the Greys, which we moved into with furniture we had begged, borrowed, and stolen. We giggled with delight at the thought of this grown-up new life. I was in my first junior role as a woman's magazine, at a woman's magazine, and Matthew worked fitting tires and exhausts, so our combined salaries were around 15 grand. A year meant we struggled to make the mortgage payments, but we didn't care, telling ourselves that it wouldn't be long before we were earning more and able to afford weekly treats and a bigger home where we could bring up the babies we had planned. But then the housing market crashed and we were plunged into negative equity. Struggling should have brought us closer, and at first it did. But as time went on and my magazine career and salary advanced, I started to resent Matthew as he drifted from one dead-end job to another. Now I have a video that I'm waiting to release to you guys um, because I'm waiting again for for YouTube's approval stuff. And what used to take 12 or 24 hours has now taken um, one of my videos that's nine days. So, But see, they shadow ban it. And and it doesn't get out to as many people. It doesn't uh, give notifications for them. And so I just need to hold on to it. Otherwise, hardly anybody watches them and it's just a waste of my time. But the the whole thing is I say in this video, I talk about when the woman makes more than the man. Of course, we know that women don't like dating down. But number two, 30% of the marriages fail on that alone. If the woman is more successful or her career takes off and his doesn't, that's 30% of marriages that are done right there. See, women want up, upward mobility. And now he's an anchor on her. Struggling should have brought us closer. I already read that part. Okay. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, struggling should have brought us closer. The first time it and the at first it did, but as time went on in my magazine career and salary advanced, I started to resent Matthew as he drifted from one dead end job to another. I still loved him, but I began to feel embarrassed by his blue collar jobs, annoyed that despite his intelligence, he didn't have a career. And th- that he brought a lur- he bought a lurid blue and pink VW Beetle. So here's the thing: dude doesn't have a job, but he still goes out and scratches together enough to at least get a vehicle to get around in. But that's not good enough. It was an ugly color. See, guys can make sacrifices where women won't. We don't care what it looks like. Does it get me to the job? Can I retain that job? Can I save more money to get a better vehicle if I want it? But you know, the logic looks long term. The feels look short-term, and too many people only worry about the feels. They don't think about long-term logic. She was feeling like, oh, what an ugly car. I don't want to be seen in it. He was thinking, hey, it's cheap, and and it saves us money until I can get a better job. I began to wish he was more sophisticated and earned more. I felt envious of friends with better-off partners who were able to support them as they started their families. Show me the money. I stopped seeing Matthew as my equal 
and stopped seeing all the qualities he had made me fall in love with him. His fierce intelligence, our shared sense of humor, his determination not to follow the crowd. Instead, I saw someone who I was, instead I saw someone who was holding me back. I encouraged him to find a career and was thrilled when he was accepted to join the police in 95. It should have heralded a new chapter in our lives, but it only hastened the end. We went from spending every evening and weekend together to hardly seeing one another. Matthew was doing round-the-clock shifts while I worked long hours on the launch of a new magazine. See, this is another thing that, that, that drives me nuts, okay? Women will say, I want a successful guy. I want that six figures. I want that income. I want that money. I want him to have enough money to do X, Y, Z. You don't get to work five hours in a, a day and make that kind of scratch. You got to work long hours. You got to work hard hours. Sometimes you have to work out um, out of work hours from the home. Okay, you know when you're whether you're a, a doctor working twelve hour shifts or you're an attorney that's working on a case coming home with stacks of books, or whether you know you're a blue collar guy that goes out and puts in eight, ten, twelve hours getting some overtime, and then you you know you come home and you're exhausted. Making that kind of money takes time, so this guy sacrifices his time. To go, I mean, working round, long, round-the-clock shifts, that's extra money. So he, she's complaining about his income. So he goes out and starts busting his hump to bring home the income. Now she's complaining he's working too much and he's not around and they don't, they don't see each other enough. You can't have it all. You've got to learn how to sacrifice one thing for another. When you need money, you make the sacrifice of seeing each other and having time. Give it a give it a little bit of time. Save up some money. Get into a comfortable place. Maybe he gets a promotion. Then you cut back on the hours. Again, logic is long term. Emotional is short term. And she's just thinking with the feels. Uh, our romantic life had dwindled and nights out together was rare. I stopped appreciating the little things he did, like leaving romantic notes on the pillow or scouring secondhand bookshops for novels he knew I'd love. He was my bet for, best friend, yet I took him totally for granted. See, he knew he was busy but he was still putting in the effort and she appreciated none of it. Why? First it was money, then it was time. His effort meant nothing. What have you done for me lately? After festering for weeks about his shortcomings, I told Matthew I was leaving. We spent hours talking and crying as he tried to convince me to stay, but I was adamant. And this, this is very similar to what happened to me. I felt like, what did I do wrong? No, my jobs weren't the best, but I was, I was working uh, part-time work at one place, full-time work at another, trying to save up money. Hopefully, we so we could get a little place, maybe move into a, a, a different area because I didn't I didn't like where we were at the time. And this just sounds like my, like my ex talking to me, because I feel very similar. Uh, and I'm sure some of you guys do too. My parents were horrified that I was walking away from the man they felt was right for me. My father's words to me that day continue to haunt me. Karen, think carefully about what you're doing. There's a lot to be said for someone who truly loves you. But I refused to listen, convinced there would be another, better Mr. Wright waiting around the corner. So what makes better? This guy was loving. He was funny. He was intelligent. He was doting. He gave you little gifts. What was better? I moved into a rented flat a few miles away in Horns Church and embraced single life with a vengeance. By now, I was an editor on a national magazine. Life was w one long round of premieres and dinners or drink parties. Matthew and I remained close, even telling each other about new relationships. But though I dumped him, I never felt the woman he'd meet were good enough. I can see now I was acting out of jealousy. I clearly wanted to keep him for myself. Our closeness was, however, called to a halt in 2000 when he met his first serious girlfriend after me, Sarah. One night shortly after his 34th birthday, I phoned to ask his advice about something. Matthew was unusually abrupt and asked me not to call him again. Please don't send me birthday or Christmas cards anymore either. Sarah opened your card last week and was really upset. I have to put her feelings first. Good man, although why he stayed friends with her, I don't know. I hated the fact that Matthew was suddenly putting another woman before me. How dare she come between us? Over the next few weeks, I'm ashamed to say I vented my spleen at both of them in a series of heated phone calls. So this poor guy gets his heart crushed by, by this woman here. 
And she still thinks that she's got some control over the situation or that he's waiting, floating around, and she might have a chance to go back to him. You know, if things don't work out for her, he said he'd be waiting and they're still talking. And I'm sure she was assuming that, well, maybe he'll, you know, maybe nothing will turn up serious and and I can always go back to him. And then the minute that snapped out of her control and she genuinely feels like that backup guy going away, she freaks out and just vents on both of them. I mean, so how, you know, how, how rude and how self-entitled you have to be. I was completely irrational, she continues. I didn't want Matthew back, but it, I felt upstaged by Sarah. Unsurprisingly, after one particularly nasty argument, Matthew put down the phone and refused to take any more of my calls. I didn't realize it at the time, but I would never speak to him again. Shortly afterwards, I met Richard. It was a whirlwind romance, and within a year, we were engaged in buying an idyllic farmhouse in the Norfolk countryside while I continued my journalistic career commuting to London. Now listen to this part. This is, again, swinging from branch to branch, but she met herself a top 10% guy. All right? And, and we say this time and time again. When the top 10% out there have all the choices, you're not going to be it. So Richard was a successful singer, and as we toured the country, I thought I had finally found the excitement and the love that I craved. She got the butterflies back, because this guy was, you know, top 10 percenter, right? Successful singer, touring around the country, probably good looking, obviously did well financially because they just bought a, a, a farm home. But Matthew was never far from my thoughts, and Richard complained that I often brought him into conversations, even comparing them both. They were so different. Although outwardly romantic, Richard was repeatedly unfaithful. Mm -hmm. Why am I not shocked? I mean, we know when a guy is the top 10% or 20% of men out there, he has many, many choices. He's not going to settle. He's going to go out and play the field and have his fun. This guy's a, I would say a rock star, but he was a, a singer and popular. So he's got people at the concerts. He's, he's got fans. He's got probably a lot of attractive women talking to him. And, and the interesting thing is she even stayed with him after he was unfaithful. Why? Because she felt lucky to have him. Uh, so again, Richard was repeatedly unfaithful and I never felt secure enough to start a family with him. Eventually, after three and a half years together, he walked out, having admitted his latest paramour uh, was pregnant by him. So he cheats, cheats, cheats. She stays with him because she's like, oh, he's so, he's so high up on this, on this food chain. What a, I'm so lucky to have a, a, a guy like this. Well, I guess I can overlook the cheating because he really loves me, but, you know, so on and so forth, because that's what they do. And then he walks out. He's like, I'm going to bounce. I've got somebody else. See ya. And she's left holding nothing. My life fell apart. Over the next year, I struggled to pull myself back together and did a lot of soul searching. I finally understood what my father had meant. I realized Matthew was the only person who had loved and understood me. When I heard through a mutual friend that he'd split up with Sarah, I wrote to him apologizing and asking for forgiveness and a second chance. A month, three months, a year, three years, and for some of us guys recently, 20 years, when you're on Facebook or social media and you get, uh, hey, what are you up to? Out of the blue from an ex-girlfriend you dated in high school. It's happened to me. I know it's happened to some of you guys. Or somebody that you dated seven years ago and, and they've, run, they, they've run out of options. They feel like there's no one else to reach out to. They don't have anybody to date. And they're starting to sniff around a little bit, see if anybody still has any interest now that they're, you know, a little bit older and they feel like their options have gone out. They look back and they say, you know, I remember he was really good to me. He was a nice guy. I could see myself settling with him now that I've had all my fun and so on and so forth. And that's what happened. She did it again. So I wrote to him apologizing, asking for forgiveness, a second chance. It was six years since we had last spoken. <laughs> but I naively thought he would want to hear from me. No. What I didn't know was that Sarah was still living at the house and it was she who opened my very personal letter and it included my phone number and she left me several angry, hurtful voicemails. Yeah, she should. 
quit because she, she just keeps trying to come back into this guy's life that she absolutely trashed. He finally said enough. He, he, he finally grew a pair. She can't leave it alone. She messed this whole thing up, but she can't help but come back into it and trying to ruin it. Now, you might be saying, hey, why are you reading us this story? Well, I've got 1,500, according to my statistics, 1,500 female listeners. This is just a little bit of, of, of understanding that when you are, no matter what your age is, if you are single, there are guys out there like Richard that you're going to lose the butterflies, you're going to lose the tingles, you're going to lose, but you've got a genuine guy that will probably take care of you and make you happy for the rest of your life. No, he's not a rock star. He's going to be a steady Eddie or steady Freddie, but you're going to be happy and you're going to be secure and you can have a good f a nuclear family and you can be happy. But too many times people chase the feels and they ruin it. And the reason why I'm reading this for you guys is because I think me personally, I like this story because it helps me understand when all this happened to me, I was Richard and man, did it burn me and it hurt and I was upset. And now it's kind of refreshing to see the other side where Maybe she doesn't think about me anymore. Maybe, you know, she, maybe I was nothing to her. But it's nice to know that at least there's there's some learning in it for those that have done this to poor Richard. And maybe it's nice to know that she's miserable for doing it. There's a little part of me that I'm kind of happy about that. Yet again, I had inadvertently caused problems in Matthew's life, so it was unsurprising I never heard from again despite writing several times over the next few months. See, she got torn up and yelled at by Sarah, his new girlfriend, and she still continues to try to contact him. Like, you are a horrible person. You are just a horrible person. In the end, I left it at birthday and Christmas cards, thinking he'd find a way to get in touch if he ever changed his mind. And then I heard a couple months ago, Matthew had married his new partner, Nicola. For a few moments, I couldn't breathe, and then the tears came. There it is. Her backup plan was gone, and she truly felt alone. Matthew and Nicola still live in uh, Essex, and as far as I know, don't yet have children. That's the next milestone I truly dread. Like, let it go, man. You, 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 the, it's dead. You beat, you've, you've killed it. It's over. Leave it be. Leave it be. It's been 11 years since Matthew and I last, last, last spoke, and I have yet to accept no, I'm sorry. It says, I have to I have to accept that door has closed. But it doesn't sound like she has. Perhaps he has found what he's looking for and I am a distant memory. Yes. I've had one other significant relationship since Richard with Rob. He was similar. But we were both too jaded from previous heartbreak to make it work. Now I can only look back and admonish myself, younger self, when I visit friends and family back in our hometown. I can't help but hope I'll bump into Matthew. The, to those that are thinking of walking away from humdrum relationships, I would say don't mistake contentment for unhappiness as I did. It could be your choice you'll regret for the rest of your life. So there it is, you know, there it is. She, she always felt like she had a backup plan with Richard and she threw it all away. And I think the lesson here to be learned is that, um, you know, a lot of times in relationships, mostly women, 99% uh, women, they say, you know, well, things are okay, but he's not making enough. He didn't get his raise or he's not making enough money that I feel that we can do X or I'm making more than him now, or he's got a blue collar job or um, whatever, right? There always seems to be something that you can say, well, I deserve better than this, but you're taking a gamble. And maybe when you're 19, like she was, Maybe nowadays you can find that guy when you're 25 or 27 or 30. But what if you don't? You know, the more time that goes on, it's, uh, and you guys have put this in, in the comments many times, so I'm not going to repeat it, but it's the, the husband's store. You know, a woman goes into the husband's store. Look that up on, uh, on the web if you want to hear an interesting joke. But, you know, they're always looking for better. But as, as, you, as you grow older and, and you spend more time looking, the the desirability lessens and that's the same for guys as well as women although men you know can be desirable well into their 60s because uh, i think one of you wrote one time um you know what is a when a when a man gets older he goes from looking good to looking like uh, sean connery when a woman gets older she goes from looking good to looking like 
Sean Connery. So, you know, we age like wine and women age like milk, and it's not fair. But the power dynamics change over time. Women in their youth, with their youth and beauty, have all the power. And that's where they try to and should try to select the, the best guy they can, they can feel that they can date and, and that can fall in love with and be happy with. And then give him your undevoted care and attention. If, and if he's not right, you break up with him and start over. She did at least. I'll give her that. She didn't get married and, and drag him into a ditch for seven or ten years and then decide to break up when they have kids. So I'll give her props for at least doing it when they were young before they got a family. But, you know, too many times the, the dynamics start to shift. And then we see women in their 30s, 35, 40s, or over 40. They're now complaining, saying, you know, oh, I just hate it. 40-year-old 40 40 year old guys that are dating girls in their 20s, ugh, like they, they're just not mature enough to date someone their own age. No, it's not that at all. What about young women? Ugh, oh, she she's just dating somebody that has money and, and is powerful or he's a rock star, or he's super popular, or tall, dark, or handsome. Why doesn't she just date an average guy that's kind of dumpy and makes an average salary? Well, women say, well, if I have the choice of dating a better man, why wouldn't I? Well, that's what men are saying. If I have a, cha a chance to date a young, exciting, fun, attractive woman, and especially with no kids, so if we do have a family, they'd be my kids I'd be raising. Sure, I'd prefer that to someone that's older, a little bitter, has you know children from another guy. Yeah, of course, that's just the way it works. And you can say it's not fair, but is it fair that women have all this power over young men in their teens and 20s? even sometimes their young 30s? No, it's not fair, but it's the way it is. Women are only upset because they lose the power and men continue to gain the power. I can hit the gym. I need to because I'm, I'm a little heavy. But I can hit the gym, and as you can tell, I hardly look 47 years old because I take care of myself, usually, when, when it's not the holidays and I'm eating horribly. And I, you know, my last girlfriend was 26. That's not fair, but that's the way it works. And to a 28-year-old guy, her dating a 47-year-old guy isn't fair. Well, I was 42 at the time, but it's not fair. Why? Because I have money, and I'm secure, and I'm intelligent, and I've got my life together, and he doesn't yet. So it's not fair to him. Life's not fair. But if, if you have the opportunity to do well and get somewhere and better yourself, then you take it. That's just what we do. Uh, links are below in my notes. Uh, I do have uh, PayPal and, and uh, my Bitcoin if you'd like to support that way. But most importantly, please comment, like, share. Um, I always want to hear from you guys and what you think. And as well, the more likes I get and the more uh, shares I get, the more my content will get out there to help other gentlemen. Guys and gals, I will leave it there for the evening. This is Better Bachelor. I am Joker. And remember, the wise warrior avoids the battle. <laughs>